made progress on assignment seven. Uh, let's see, oh, uh, final next week. Everyone stoked? Last week of class, also excited? Not as excited, okay. Uh, cool, all right, well, let's finish off, we're gonna finish off, yeah. Um, is there gonna be a submission page for assignment? Yes, 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 uh, today. Okay, thank you. Cool, okay, so. Let's go over, so now we're gonna finish out application security by really digging in and understanding what goes on when a buffer <laughs> overflow occurs. Uh, so, somebody remind me, what is the CDECL calling convention? <coughs> you know, this close to the final, the less answers I get, the more difficult the exam gets. Uh, what is the CDECL calling convention? Somebody remind us. Like, what are the rough order of steps involved? pushes that onto the stack. Call. The call instruction, exactly. Cool. And then what does the caller do? Somebody else. So the function or the call lead, the function that got called. Pushes the base pointer on the stack. Save the base pointer and then what? base pointer replaces the saved base pointer. So we essentially, when we call a function, essentially two of our registers are saved onto the stack. One is the base pointer, so we have saved EDP, and then we also have saved EIP, right, of where we're going to come back to when we're done executing. And fundamentally, nothing, so again, think about, so memory, are there any restrictions on your program of what memory on the stack you can read and write to? No, why not? Because there's not, it's a stack, it needs to read and write. It's literally, we, call, we started it off with stack is the kind of scratch memory for your program. It needs to be able to read and write to that, yeah. Louder? So the question was, how do you change? Ah, so the basic, uh, so you're talking about call by reference or call by value. So essentially, the compiler, uh, you can think of it as call by um, reference. Basically, it means a pointer is pushed onto the stack as an argument. And then when you change that, you dereference that pointer. And so that's why it gets changed. Um, pass by value means the actual value gets copied into there. That's why that function gets a fresh copy of that, and any changes you make doesn't propagate back. So it's actually very similar. I mean, because uh, again, x86 doesn't have any of these concepts, right? Of pass by reference, pass by value. So the compiler has to trick you into thinking that that's what happened based on how it compiles that function. So a similar thing in like Java, right? Java, do you ever think about pointers? No, but do pointers essentially exist in Java? Yeah. Yeah, right? You've ever passed an object into a function and then that uh, function call, or either changed the field of your object or called parameters on your object, right? It's essentially a pass by, some sense of pass by reference type thing, but under the hood it's just passing a pointer to that object. Um, so that's kind of how that all works under the hood. Cool. Okay, so what would happen if somebody, if an attacker is able to control the saved instruction pointer that's on our stack. What could they theoretically do? Yeah. You could change where the program continues after the function. Right. So it's important to remember, once a function is called at the very end, the return instruction essentially says, whatever the saved instruction pointer was on the stack, start executing code from there. There's nothing that says, start executing code from the instruction that called me, because that information is stored on the stack. 
yeah, maybe with the, uh, by changing EVP, we may be able to change the base pointer that's set when we return. So we may be able to move, essentially move our function frame around, which is pretty cool. Uh, so let's look through an example of this. Um, so here, I have a very simple function called my copy. So what, what is my copy doing? What are the semantics of that function? Yeah. Takes an argument for the string and then copies that into Boo. Yeah, so it takes a character pointer argument, so it's a pointer to some character array, and it's going to copy that onto Foo. What is Foo? Character array. Yeah, four character buffer or array that's on the stack, so we know it's a local variable, it's allocated on the stack. Uh, what are the semantics of string copy? I think string copy keeps going until it sees a null terminator. Yeah, so copy all the characters from string into foo, right? These are just pointers, so they're pointers to memory regions. Copy one, well, first test, does string point to a null byte? If it points to a null byte, what does that mean? <coughs> Why does it stop? <coughs> yeah, because in a string, right, so in uh, C, a character pointer is a series of alphanumeric characters followed by a zero, like a null byte. Uh, so basically test, is the character we're pointing to null? If it is, stop. If it's not, copy that to where foo points, and then increment each pointer by one and keep doing the same thing. So just copy over. So is there anything? So how does string copy know that the buffer foo only has four bytes allocated for it? It doesn't. It doesn't have any way of knowing. No, so fundamentally, we'll get into this in a bit, but fundamentally string copy, if you control the source string and can make that as big a size as you want, there's no possible way for the programmer to tell string copy, only copy four bytes from the string to foo. How would uh, somebody have to do that? So how could you do this safely if you use string copy? So maybe you could write your own for loop, but what do you have to keep in mind to be secure? Yeah. So you could maybe use a different function, string n copy, that only copies four bytes because you know the size of foo. What else could you do if you were dead determined to use string copy? Yeah. Check the length. Check the length of the string, right? Because you know, so if a string copy is if string length of str variable is greater than four, then throw an error or return null or whatever you're gonna do to signify that that does not work. Cool. Okay. Then we have our main function. In our main function, we're gonna copy, pass a string into my copy, we're gonna print out after, we're gonna return zero. So I don't know, this is a tip, I guess, if you're ever making slides for anything, don't put the date or a specific class number in here, because I've reused these many times since. Um. <coughs> okay, so then we have to look at then what's the assembly code of this function. So we can look, we can see that main, so what is the first thing that main has to do? Store the base pointer, right? It goes back to the calling convention. Main must store its base pointer, the base pointer of whoever called it. So first push EVP to store the same base pointer on the stack. Um, let's think for a minute. Right when main is called, where is, what's currently on the stack? That would be below the stack. What is, if we were to draw the stack diagram, what is the stack currently pointing to when main is called? How did we get to that function? Close. Address of main? Sorry, I couldn't hear it because yeah. Yeah. We haven't pushed the base point on the stack yet, so let's all I'll bring this up here. Let's say we are right before this instruction push EDP. So we're pointing here, somebody has called us. So what's on the stack right now? The address of what called it? Yeah, or very close, the address, the save instruction pointer, right? The address of where we should go after main is called, right? We know for every 
function that must be there because we're going to return and we're going to jump to whatever that is on the stack at this point. This is just a helpful double check. Um, so we're going to first push EVP. We're going to set up our base pointer, moving the um, stack pointer into the base pointer. We're then going to subtract 16 hex from the stack pointer. We're then going to move some constant value, 804, 8504, onto the stack pointer. What's this value? Address of the function? No, not quite. I mean, I guess it theoretically could be, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah, what's the parameter? Yeah, but what is that? Yes, it's the address of the string. Perfect. I guess it would help if we looked at the next line, which was call my copy, so we can see that that's where that address is, right? So, so we're passing in essentially a character pointer, right? We can look at the at the um, function signature of my copy. My copy takes in a character pointer. Why does the why is it this value eight hundred four eighty five hundred four? That's just where the string was stored. Yeah, it's where the compiler decided to store the string, right? Here we have this constant <laughs> string. We've decided somewhere in memory of where to store this, so the compiler says, "I'm just going to pick a memory place that's at that place." So there's a little bit more uh, of how this is actually specified and alpha headers, all that stuff. But essentially, it doesn't really matter. We know that when this program loads. So what's going to be the byte that is at 804.8504? Yeah, the hex representation of A, right? And then plus one from that will be the hex representation of S, and plus one from that will be the hex representation of U, and so on, right? So this is essentially the compiler needs to store this string somewhere. Yeah. So that that hex value there then is pretty much always going to change. Every time a program, there's nothing valuable from it intrinsically. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it won't change every time you run, but every time you compile the program, it could decide to put it in a different order or wherever. So yeah, essentially, this is, in some sense, arbitrary, except that for our program to be correct, these bytes must be at that memory location. Yeah? So the memory address is like local to the memory given to the program, or is it like universal, that number? Local, local. So every process has its own view of memory. So for every process, the OS tricks it into thinking it has full access from zero to FFF. Got it. Okay. All right. So then, okay. So we call this function. Then what must happen after this? Looking at the C code of me. Do we do anything with the return value of my copy? No. <coughs> no. So what do we do? You gotta put it in the string. Print. Yeah, we have to call the printf function and pass it the parameter a string pointing to after, which would probably look very similar to this. Yeah. And then we return zero. So it'll be the same as we want to move out and then yeah. Should be another move uh, into EAX, this time moving EAX on the stack. Why I chose to do this differently than the other one. I Absolutely no idea. Um, but we do this, so we're moving 804 8517. What what is that 804 8517? <coughs> yeah, it's a pointer to the string after. And the string after is just the bytes A F T E R zero. So there's a null byte. We know there must be a null byte at the end. Then we call printf, stuff happens, then we move zero into EAX, leave and return. So this is all the functionality of this function main compiled. Good. Which loop register to leave the return access? Leave. Ah, good question for the class. So what does leave do? Pulls off the instruction pointer. What was that? Pulls up the instruction pointer from the stack. Return does that. What about leave? You set it up to get ready to. So leave, so it's 
helpful to remember we're executing some function. We have the, um, the base pointer pointing somewhere up a little bit higher. We have the stack pointer has moved down to allocate memory for the stack. So what leave does is undoes all of that. So it sets the, let me make sure I get this right. It's setting the, copying the base pointer into the stack pointer to move the stack pointer up where the base pointer is. At that moment, we are pointing to the saved base pointer, and then it does a pop EDP to reset the base pointer up. And then return goes to the stack. And then return essentially pops the saved instruction pointer off the stack into EIP. Which is the one that leaves
16 bytes there for our local stack. And then it's going to copy this value onto the stack so that it can call this function. Why 16? Just because. Those compilers are done. Yeah. Uh, compilers do things for lots of reasons. I think it's so that the, the I think it's one of these things of uh, it needs to store four bytes on the stack at least, but that's a weird offset, so it does 16 bytes. All right, so we move this value onto the stack. So now as a caller, based on the calling convention, we've done everything we need to do to set everything up. We've placed the argument to the function on the stack. Now we need to call it. What happens, what does this call instruction do? We jump up the byte copies. So call jumps to 80483F4, and what else? Pushes what on the stack? So, um, the address of my copy. Is this one? Very close. Not the address of my copy. The, um, the, the, address, after the address after my copy. Exactly. 804-8423. The address after this call. Right? Essentially, this is the breadcrumb. We need to call a function. We need to know how to go backwards. Where to go after this function starts executing. So we call my copy. We push 804 8423 onto the stack, which is this instruction here, the one right after the call to my copy. So this is, again, now we're in a situation, new function just got called, my copy. And again, we can see visually in this example that where the stack pointer is currently pointing is exactly to the return address. Right? So the save. Uh, saved instruction pointer. Question so far? Ooh, I'm supposed to copy all of my computer. All right, so what does my copy do? Push EVP. So saving main's base pointer onto the stack. So we have going bottom up, we have the save base pointer and then the save instruction pointer. And then above that, the argument to the function. Then we move the stack pointer into the base pointer to set up our base pointer. Uh, we need a bunch more room, so we need we then subtract 28 hex from ESP. Again, another example, why 28 hex? I have no idea. Because it decided to do that. How much space did it need for our buffer? Four bytes, right? It was a four byte buffer, but it just decided to give us 28 bytes, and I decided to put it at, uh, what's C? 12? Yeah, so 12 bytes below. All right, so what's an EVP plus eight? Yeah? The address of the string, which to my copy is the argument of the function, right? And why is it EDP plus 8? It says it gets past the base pointer. The yeah, because there's, the, exactly, there's the save base pointer and then the save instruction pointer. So at EDP is the save base pointer, at EDP plus 4 is the save instruction pointer, and at EDP plus 8 is the first argument. And then for beyond that, EDP plus 12 would be the second argument, third argument, fourth argument. Where does that um, base pointer come from again? Where's that pointing to? Is that the, is that what called main? This base pointer? Yeah. Yeah, this is, this, okay, so this base pointer is main's base pointer. So FD2D0 is here, uh, er, yeah, is here. Got it. Should be above that. Should be above that, it should be here. Well, I'm never gonna change it, so. I was gonna say that this probably. Um, let's walk back slightly. Okay, yeah, I must have messed that up. But anyways. No, 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 that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. This is FD2D4. This is FD2D0. Okay, yes. That's right. Okay, question again? Oh, that answer it. Yeah. Okay, and then this base pointer is the base pointer of the function that called me. Okay, oh, got it. Kind of keeps going up. You, you could walk this to figure it out, but. Okay, 
So we've moved EBP plus 8 into EAX. We move EAX into ESP plus 4. What's the difference between the move EBP plus 8 and the into EAX and the load effect of address of EBP minus C into EAX? What did the move instruction do? Going back up here. So what does this do? Yeah. So the first move is moving the value stored at that position. Right? Yes. And the second is just like calculating the sum. And the so again, it comes back to pointers, right? The way, another way to think about this is a pointer dereference. So here, it's essentially calculate EBP plus eight. Whatever that memory location is, dereference that, grab that value, and copy it into EAX. Right? So another way, like you said, was uh, move the data stored at EBP plus 8 into EAX. Right? So literally copy those bytes here to here. And then copy that uh, onto the stack. Then what is this load effective address doing? Yeah, so a load effect of address essentially means compute the address, but don't dereference it. So what is EBP minus C? EBP minus C is FB2AC. Move that value, not the memory that's stored there, into EAX. So after we do this, EAX will have the value FD2AC. That make sense? And then we move that onto the stack. So we have FD2AC on the stack, and then 804, 8504 above that. So we essentially push onto the stack all, all the arguments to string copy from right to left. Sorry, could you explain what LEA does? Yeah, so it's load effective address. So it just basically says calculate EBP minus C and move it into EAX. Okay. So the value of EBP minus C, not, don't do a dereference. Oh, okay. So this is move, so, EB, so it just calculates, what is EBP minus C? Oh, that's FD2AC, move that into EAX, and then move that onto the stack. Questions so far? All right, so we're about to call string copy. What's gonna happen? So the call is going to push, uh, yeah, it's going to push the address of the leave instruction, so 804, 840C onto the stack. String copy is going to do what it, what it does, but what is it going to do? So what is, like, we talked about what string copy does, what is it going to do here? It's going to store stuff into the space allocated for it, or if there's too much to overflow that. Yeah, or that even makes it seem smarter than it is, right? So all it's going to do is dereference 804-8504, right? Grab a byte and copy it to FD2AC, and then increment by one. So then copy the next byte from 804-8505 uh, into FD2AB, and just keep going until it hits a null byte from this. Right? So, yeah. When it does that, does it do that going like, so if you overrode the bounds, would that go further down the stack or up the stack? So if you, you had it too long. It inc so a string is uh, points to, let's see, the string points to the data, yeah. and then you increment it by one to get to the next element. So, so where, does going, where does going plus one go in, this, in, this, in the stack? <laughs> uh, up. So that goes up. Okay. Exactly. So we write up, so, which means, if I can get to where you're going, if you start writing up at FD2AC, how many bytes do you need to write before you get to the saved base pointer? 
guys think about this. What is each of these squares? Four bytes. Four bytes. So four bytes. So write four bytes, get here. Write four bytes, get here. Write four bytes. And now you're starting to overwrite the same base pointer. So C. What was... So actually this is very nice because we already have, we know it's actually C bytes below because we have this load effective address of EDP minus C. So we know that from that buffer, there are 12 bytes between that buffer and the save base pointer, which is at EDP. Does that make sense? Responsibility to is the caller's responsibility to make sure that the stack is consistent when it returns. So basically, so the parameters are still on the stack. Yes, like so. Right after this call string copy, the stack will be exactly at this location where we left it. So these parameters will definitely still be here on the stack. So the goal when doing this is to override the base pointer of the function that called string copy. That is one one thing we can do is overwrite that base pointer. And then what's four bytes above the base pointer? The instruction pointer. What happens if we overwrite that instruction pointer? We can make the program go Yeah, we can make the program go wherever we want. Where specifically? So does string copy go wherever we want? Like what instruction here makes it go wherever we want? Return, right? Which return? There's two. The returning my copy, so that's what's called string copy. Yeah, the return of my copy, this this instruction here, this ret instruction, if we're able to alter that saved instruction pointer on the stack, this 804, 8423, we can make it point to and go wherever we want. And that's the one above the base pointer or the base pointer? This is the one above the base pointer. So this is the base pointer here. At uh, FD2B8 and four above that, the same EIT, exactly. So the same instruction pointer, if we're able to alter that, we can go anywhere we want. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Yeah. That's C and load effective address. Yeah. Is that arbitrary as well? Yes, it needs to be at least four bytes. So that's the other thing that's slightly surprising about this is why didn't the compiler decide it at EVP minus four? It could totally do that for whatever reason, to decide a DVP minus C. But this is actually the important thing of why it's really important to look at the assembly. Because if you just looked at this C code, you may say, oh, there's only four bytes to overflow to get to the save base pointer. Um, I'm just going to overflow 12 bytes, because that would overwrite the four bytes, the save base pointer, and then the save instruction pointer. You do that, you find out it doesn't work, and you don't understand why. You have to actually look at the, the code here. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you need at least 12 bytes to get to the saved base pointer and then the saved instruction pointer. Okay. So it always allocates like a little bit more. I wouldn't say always, but it often does. Okay. Because if you allocated 12 bytes, I think it would still put it in exactly the same space. Maybe. There's also a lot of compiler options you can specify to change these things. So. Okay, so then let's look through what happens at string copy. So what does the memory look like? Well, what does string copy do? Again, to remind us, at 804.8504 is this string. So this means it's copying at FD2AC, it's going to be ASU space. Now, this is the weird thing is again because of endianness, if we view this as an integer, the space is the largest uh, byte, and the A is the smallest byte, even though the A is the value we wrote first. So it's essentially backwards than what we would expect. Going up, CSE space, again the same thing, interpreting that as an as an integer, does it matter what these uh, these twelve bytes are? Kind.
kind of, kind of no. What if there's a null byte in there? Oh, right. You can't let it in here. Yeah, so if there's a null byte in here, then it will stop and it won't copy any more bytes. This can be tricky. This is why I keep harping if you come to office hours or whatever about what does the man page say the specific semantics of this function are because um, sometimes when you're doing these things, uh, if your input has a new line in it, then some functions read up to a new line. So you actually won't get in enough data for a new line. Null bytes are also very difficult to deal with. Okay. And we keep going. So then we do fall, F-A-L-L. And now, so now we've overwritten the saved base pointer. Does the program crash at this point? Why not? We've overwritten a buffer. Shouldn't the program crash? Why not? Yeah, because this is memory that it can read and write to, right? It has permissions to read and write to all of this memory on the stack. It can keep going all the way up. Uh, at some point, you will run out of stack space, and you will cause a set call just by writing. But from our little example here, that will definitely not happen. Keep going, overwriting um, the saved instruction pointer on the stack, and then overwriting the argument above that, and keep going up all the way until it hits a null byte. The one thing I did not mention here that definitely happens is the null byte is also copied, so technically there will be a null byte here. Which can get into, you know, affects things sometimes. But the one we're targeting here for a normal attack is the instruction pointer. That's the only one. It's the it's easiest to bend the, the control flow, yes, to your will. Um, and change where it wants to go. Okay. So now my copy or string copy returns. Does my copy know that its stack has been messed with? No, what does it do? It just does whatever these instructions say it should do, right? There's no additional checking. Everything to understand exactly what's happening is contained in these assembly instructions. So we have leave. What does leave do? Copies the stack pointer into the base pointer. So it sets the base pointer pointing to the stack pointer. And then there's a pop EDP. So essentially, the sh um, what should happen is the base pointer should get the value 6C, 6C, 6166. Does that crash anything? No. No, when would it crash something? So let's say. If something tries to go to the base pointer. If we tried to dereference something, exactly. So if we had another instruction somewhere after this that said dereference the base pointer and then grab something, this memory region is likely unmapped, and so we'll get a set call because we tried to access some memory that's not mapped. Okay. So now we go return, now what happens? We can go to EIP. Yeah, so now we do a pop EIP, right? So we're gonna try to start executing from 3130, 3220. And that will crash. And that will crash the program, that will cause the set fault. So if you do this, uh, you'll see, so running this with GCC, this example, running 8.0, you'll see that familiar set fault core dump. And then if you GDB and debug this, you will see that it received a um, seg fault, and specifically at 3130, 3220. So it tried to access that and could not. And looking at the registers, we can see that the registers actually have EDP as 60, 60, 6166, and EIP as 3130, 3220. So let's say, so question one, where did this string come from? Yes. That's also, the core dumps are actually very nice because you can load in a core dump of a program that's not even running and look at the registers and the state of the program at the moment that it crashed. Okay. So uh, where did this string come from? Exactly, it's hard coded. We, as a developer, coded that string up. What if that string came from an argument variable? The user controls it. 
Yeah, then the user or an attacker essentially controls it, and what registers could they then control? Yeah, EIP and what else? And EDP, right? Cool. So going back for a second here. So yeah. So like we might be doing this, but uh, return I remember from last class would pop. Uh, no, no, no. So the return value itself is put into EAX. Uh, the return instruction pops whatever the stack is currently pointing to into EIP, so the instruction pointer. So basically, it's go jump to wherever the stack, whatever value is currently on the stack. Okay. Which is the which next instruction. In this case, yes, which should have been the next instruction of the function that called us. Right? So in this case, it should have been uh, this value. 804, 8423. Right. So then what? So where could we go in this program? Anywhere. Anywhere. We could go, we could actually just make this program jump back to main. And then have it do this again, and it would loop forever. Uh, we could have it go to my copy and copy more stuff, and probably crash at some point because the pointers are really messed up at that point. Uh, but we don't have to do that. We can actually we can actually jump to any of these addresses, and technically we can jump to uh, even essentially between an instruction. So. You see here, there's uh, how many bytes is this? I can't do this math. I don't know. A lot of bytes in between here. You can actually jump to in between these instructions. Um, you together two instructions to make something that might or might not be an instruction. Exactly. Exactly. So if there were, let's say, a function that would uh, set you at, I don't know, if there was, let's say, an admin function. There's an admin functionality that when you called it, it gave you access as an admin. All you have to do is change this saved instruction pointer on the stack to go to that function. And then as soon as my copy returns, it would then start executing that function. Yeah. Can you only jump to memory locations that are already on the program? Can you jump to anywhere in the RAM pretty much? So technically you can jump to anywhere in RAM. It gets slightly more complicated. That's why I'm ignoring it a little bit for now of the different uh, permissions of memory regions. So uh, typical memory regions have either read, write, or execute permissions. So for instance, it used to be that you could actually, the stack itself was executable. So you could essentially write assembly instructions onto the stack and jump back onto the stack itself to start executing code of your choosing. Um, Crappy IoT devices are still done this way, like uh, for terrible reasons. Uh, most modern systems will disable the stack being executable. So we're actually going to go over a second how to go beyond that. Yeah. So I just want to clarify our goal here is not to execute our own code, it's to maliciously execute the code that's already written. Yes, in, in an example. So one, one way of doing this so if we can execute code of our choosing, then great. Oftentimes now that that is uh, not feasible to do, so we need and you can. There's plenty of resources and techniques of learning how to do shell code and all this other stuff to actually do that. But for right now, we're gonna ignore that. That's true. Yeah. If the stack is not executable on the program, are you able to write to where the instructions are stored? No. So usually the instructions are read only, read and execute, and not writable. So the entire concept is. Uh, uh, reading and ex sorry, writing and executing are ex uh, exclusive. So a memory region can either be writable or executable, but never both. Uh, and so this helps prevent things, but we'll see super clever ways around that. But first, I want to talk about different types of functions that are essentially vulnerable by default. So uh, specifically, gets. So gets reads um, from standard input. 
until it gets to, I believe, a new line, and sends that into a buffer. But it has literally, oh, no new lines and no end of file. But there's, this is a 100% dangerous function. It literally is impossible to do get safely. Because you can't tell gets how many, um, how many of them copy. Uh, string copy, string cat, uh, sprintf, so printing into a string, scanf, custom input routines. But now we need to go about how to exploit this. Okay. All right. Okay. So once you control the instruction pointer, you can then turn that into arbitrary code execution. Um, there is actually this great paper called Smashing the Sack for Fun and Profit if you want to learn about this older style of shellcode, jumping to an executable stack, all this fun stuff. Um, and the goal is we essentially want to write some code. So, so our high level goal as an attacker is to do what? What do we want to do? Yeah, we want to make, in some sense, make the program do something that it's not supposed to do based on its security policy. Right? So going all the way back to the beginning, the, fun, the program should do something, right? It has a, basically a security policy of things that it should do. We're trying to make it violate its security policy. So that could be for a set UID program that is set UID root. That is, uh, we want to trick it into doing stuff that we want it to do, right? Uh, maybe we wanted to add us to a level or a group or something. Um, because, so what we want is in some sense, we want that program to execute code of our choosing, right? Because the program has its functionality, it's defined in code. We want to trick it to doing whatever we want it to do because this code now has the same privilege as the vulnerable, as the application. Um, so one type of thing we really want to do is just call bin sh. Uh, so this is where the term shell code comes in. We want some code to execute a shell bin sh so that we can do whatever commands we want to do as the permissions of that user. Really, it's just uh, assembly code to perform a specific purpose. Uh, so we can write some assembly code. We can write it very carefully so that it has no nulls, no new lines. There's plenty of resources for that if you want to get into that. Um, but as I mentioned, the problem of injecting our code is the question was where, right? So if we have code that we want to write, where do we execute that code? Or where do we put that code? Right, if the program has the correct memory permissions such that nothing is both writable and executable, that means we can't write to anything that is executable, we can't inject our code anywhere. So, this brings up a super cool exploitation technique called return-oriented programming, which is uh, kind of getting closer and closer to the pinnacle of what kind of modern exploitation is. Um, the idea is, so as we talked about, so um, we talked about one way would be to call a function, right? If there's a, and actually, so going back a bit. So we said we could call a function Right? So we can put the save instruction pointer, point it to another function. That way the return will go to that function. Where does that function get its arguments? What was it? Yeah, where does a function that is called get its arguments from? Yeah, so it gets it from the base pointer, right? So this example of I copy, EVP plus eight. EVP comes from the stack pointer, right? Everything's on the stack. Who controls the stack? In this case. We've completely changed the stack, right? The contents of the stack. So not only can we decide what functions get called, we can actually change the arguments to those functions to other things that we want to have happen. And so, and this is, we can also, um, one of the cool things is this technique called return to libc, which basically says, uh, okay, um, maybe I can just reuse libc. Libc has this nice function called system. I can just jump to system and pass the argument bin sh. And then at that point, I've, uh, 
I've executed a shell, and I've reused the code of the application. I'm not using any of my own code. Uh, return oriented programming goes a little bit farther and says, uh, what if we essentially execute just little snippets of code that by combining them in a crazy way actually does what we want to do? So we'll, sh we'll walk through this. I was introduced in 2005, so it's an old-ish technique, but it's much newer than the stuff we're talking about. Um, anyways, there's a really cool uh, paper here about, uh, it's called the, the Geometry of Innocent Flesh on the Bone, which is a super cool title of the paper. Uh, return into Lindsay without function calls. Okay, so let's look at an example, I think this will help. So, main function, a buffer foo, a copy of argv1 onto foo, return 10. Easy, simple, simple program. We don't even have any other functions we're gonna call. Is this vulnerable? Yes. Why? Because <coughs> string copy specifically with arguments that an attacker controls. Right? So a string copy by itself is not always vulnerable. It depends on if the attacker can give inputs that's bigger than the buffer, then it can trigger a buffer overflow. Cool. Okay. So what's the first instruction of main? Push ABP, awesome. Then set up our, our base pointer, move stack pointer to the base pointer, subtract 3C from ESP, move EBP plus C into EAX. What's EBP plus C? What's EBP plus eight? This is just room for the arguments. The first argument, EBP plus eight is the first argument, in this case is our C. So EBP plus C is argv. Then we add four to EAX. Why do we add four? Index one. Index one, yeah. So we're getting argv as a pointer. We're indexing one into that array, so that's adding four. And then we're dereferencing that by moving wherever that points into EAX. So this finally gets us to a pointer to the string that, the, that, the, uh, that was passed in as the argv. Then we move that onto the stack pointer. We then load the effective address of EDP minus 32. Is, is 32 50? That makes sense. Yeah, so here it did exactly the amount of space it needed. Then move EAX into ESP, call string copy, uh, move 10 into EAX, leave and return. So this is this. Uh, we can compile this, we can look at this. So one thing different here about the other compilations is we're using the dash static option. So what is that? Yeah. Perhaps the memory address is for the randomized memory distribution. Not quite. That's a uh, no PIE, I believe. Which you may also need for this, but yeah. It's static in the library. Yes. So libc, right? Libc is a bunch of code. It's a library function. Normally, when you call a library function, it is dynamically loaded into your process, your application. But statically, it means it's compiling all that code into one. So all of libc is included here because we need this string copy function. And we can see that it's 716 kilobytes of data, which is a lot of data. But this has, anyways, we won't get into it. It has a lot of nice properties. Um, but we assume the program was compiled like this. We can then, okay, so we need to first find little bits of gadgets in the program that we can reuse and essentially encode our shellcode idea of calling system or exec VE bin sh. So we want to invoke bin sh. And so what do we need to do that? We looked at system calls with x86. So to call exec VE, we need the value of b in eax, that's exec ve. We need the address of a string bin sh into ebx. We need the address of an array that is the address of bin sh and then null in ecx. And finally, we need null in ebx. Uh, but we need to figure out where to put bin sh. So we need the string bin sh somewhere in memory. 
So the read elf command you can use to look at a binary, and this will give you this nice, uh, ridiculous table that don't let it scare you. Um, shows you all the different memory areas of the program and what their permissions are. So uh, we, the thing we're interested in here is this column, uh, the FLG, the flag column. So the X are executable, uh, the W is writable. So we need something that's writable. So let's say we are going to target this dot data section. So the nice thing about this is it says that the way to read this is address 080EA060 at that memory address will be writable memory. So if we can write the string bin sh there, now we've got that string somewhere in memory. So we're going to use this information stored in our pocket as we look at this binary. Okay. Now we need, so, okay, we need to write this string bin sh somewhere. We need some gadget that will write some data into memory and then return. So we're going to search. We will find a gadget that if we jump to, and if we set save the IP to 809A67D, these two instructions happen. So what happens here? So what are the semantics of this little gadget? So what's the first instruction? Let's move EAX, EDX, or EDX. Yeah. Is it just going to move the value of EAX into EDX? Really Very close. Move the value of EAX where? What do the parentheses mean? In the memory pointed to by EDX. Yeah. So if there's a memory address in EDX, then we will copy whatever's in EAX into EDX and then return. Seems very simple. Yeah. So without parentheses, if the value 10 is in EAX, we will copy 10 into EDX. So after that instruction executes, the EDX register will have the exact same value as EAX. If with the parentheses like this, we are going to dereference EDX. So we're going to say whatever EDX points to, so it points to some memory region, we will copy 10 into that memory region. So the value, the EAX, the EDX register does not change, the memory that EDX points to changes. So this allows us to change, essentially, so if we assume we can control EAX and EDX, we can now write to wherever we want in memory. So assume for now, we'll show how we can get there, but assume for now, we control the EAX register, we control the EDX register, and we know we control the instruction pointer, so we can force the instruction pointer to go here, so if we assume we have EAX and EDX, we can <laughs> write a value somewhere in memory. And then what will happen in this return? What does the return do? Yeah, sets the instruction pointer to be wherever the, whatever the value is on the stack at that point. Who controls the stack on a buffer overflow? We do, the attacker. This means that after this little gadget happens, we can make it go wherever else we want, maybe to another gadget that does something. So let's see how we can. So we can do something very nice. So let's say, what if we have the register EAX be the data slash bin? So slash BIN. If we have E here, sorry, EDX be the address of data, 080EA060. Then after we execute this gadget, we will have copied slash BIN to this memory location. So we're trying to build up and be able to write the string slash BIN slash SH. But we need more gadgets. We can't control EAX yet. We can't control EDX. We need something else. So we need to get our data into EDX. It turns out there's a very nice instruction. Pop EDX, pop 
does what? Takes the value off the stack, moves into that register. Who controls the stack? We control the stack. So now we can put whatever value we want onto the stack, call this gadget, it will pop that value off the stack into EDX, followed by a return, where it will then go where, wherever we want after that fact. So using this, now we can control EDX. So we can set up and put whatever value we want in EDX. We need another gadget to put whatever we want in EAX, and now we're able to write anything wherever we want. So let's look at what happens uh, just as a little example. So now we're going to run this program. We're going to pass in 50 A's. Why 50? The buffer. So I guess that's the buffer. And then what are the next four bytes? Yeah, what is, it, what is that going to be overwriting? The BCBE. The base pointer, and then the next four? Why is this backwards? Yeah, because of the little Indian. So this means I'm going to go to 0806E918. So that's I'm overwriting the save uh, return address. And then what's this next value on the stack? This will be whatever we put into EDX. So this gadget, this was, uh, let's go back. Yeah. yeah, so this is this address. So we're showing how one gadget works. So when we run this, we'll get essentially to this point of the program. So it's essentially exactly the same as we had before, the string copy, everything. So we have overwritten the 50 A's from our buffer, right? So that was our input, 50 A's. Then we overwrote the save base pointer, 65, 64, 63, 62. And then we overwrote 0806E91A. And then, uh, what was that? The reverse of that? So 62, 63, 64, 65. So string copy happens, and we know that nothing crashes here. We've just overwritten the memory. So we'll walk through these last instructions here. Moving 10 into EAX, a leave will, again, move the stack pointer into the base pointer and then do a pop EDP. So the base pointer is now 65, 64, 63, 62, our value that we passed in. And what's, so is it going to crash at, on this return? No. Why not? So it's an actual, so. This is an actual address that is executable. So it's a real address in the program that is executable. So we return from here, we're going to start executing there. Does the program know that it's now executing some weird function halfway through a function in libc? No, all it cares about is just executing these things. So now it's going to do pop edx, so what's going to happen? 62, 63, 64, 65 goes into edx, and then it's going to return, where's it going to return to? Yeah, it's going to return. So here, this was the second argument. So this was the argument here. So essentially, we have a gadget here that when we call it, we'll put whatever the next value is into EDX, and then we'll jump to whatever the instruction we put after that, whatever address is after that. So with this gadget of pop EDX return, we can put the value into EDX. Now we need a gadget to put our data into EAX. It turns out there's a really nice gadget at uh, 08OBB6D6 of pop EAX return. Uh, and there's a lot of other gadgets. So we need to control what registers? The EBX register to call exec VE. Uh, we need to control the ECX register. Um, we need to, so we'll see, there's other things that will come in handy. Um, uh, clearing out EAX, so XORing a register with itself will clear it out. Incrementing a register. And finally calling an int 80. So we need to call an int 80 to call a syscall that calls into the system. So now we can actually use this to completely build up our shellcode. Um, so we can keep doing this, but this gets kind of insane. 
writing it like this. So there are tools and better ways. So we can actually write this as a uh, Python script. So this is without using anything fancy. All we're using is uh, the struct module to be able to tell Python that we want certain things in little or big Indian. So we're going to create our payload, so our payload P. So we're going to first have 50 A's and then B, C, D, E. So where is that? So that's going to be our input as RV1 to this program. So what is that overflow going to do? Yeah, so it's going to change first just 50 A's and then the base pointer, B, C, D, E. And now we need to copy slash bin to dot data. So we already saw this. We're going to, now we're appending to P our payload. We're going to pack. This is, again, you can ignore the Python syntax. This pack means turn this number into little Indian. So we don't have to do that anymore. This is the nice thing about doing this. And so we're going to call this gadget. We have a nice comment here that tells us exactly what this gadget is. Pop edx and return. What do we want to be in the edx? The address of dot data. So we're going to first copy in the string slash bin into dot data. So this is the address of data that we learned from looking at the elf header. Now we need to control eax because we need the string slash bin there. So again, remember, as we saw, so just like before, whatever is after this on the stack is where this gadget is going to go return and execute from. And we control the stack. So now we can make it go to pop eax return, which will take whatever the next argument is, in this case, slash bin, which is what we want. And it will move that into eax. Now at this point, we will have the string, we will have the value eax, in the EAX register will be slash BIN, that string. And the value inside EDX will be the address of dot data. So now when we call our gadget to copy EAX into wherever EDX is pointing to, that will actually change the memory of the program and write the value slash BIN. This make sense? Okay, now we need to uh, do some. So now we need to copy. Yeah. Um, okay, so just I'm slightly lost. So you want to. So I understand up until where we override the base pointer mm -hmm. and we feed in a set of, you know, an address that's actually executable. Yes. So now we are doing PRG. We're essentially reusing little tiny bits of code to do things that we want it to do. Yeah. And each, sorry, I guess the other important thing is each of these little bits of code is re, is using values onto the stack, getting them into registers because we control the stack. So why do we? So we've already moved, um, you know, EAX into EDX. Right? Okay. At this point, right here. Yeah. Yeah. So these yeah. essentially these what, three, four, five lines are all about doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so what's in EAX? So an EAX is, so the way to essentially read this is this will pop whatever the next value is into EAX. So this will pop slash bin into EAX. So we need the string slash bin slash sh somewhere in memory because we want to call exec de with a pointer to that string. So we're using this fixed memory location because we saw in the elf header that essentially global variables are always stored at this location. So we know this is a fixed memory location that never changes, so we can store our data there. So what we're trying to do is get the string slash bin slash sh into memory. We have a little bit of a problem because if we did slash sh zero, we'd have a null byte. So we're gonna use a nice trick of adding an extra slash to our sh. Sure. So our string will technically be slash bin slash slash sh. Luckily, um, the OS doesn't care about that at all, and it, all these extra slashes are redundant. So again, and we can see we need, in order to copy this value into the address of data plus four, 
So what's currently at data is slash bin. So now we want to write to four plus that. We want to write the rest of our string there. We need essentially the same five lines again, but changed so that we call the same gadget of pop edx return. And we need to pass in there the address of data plus four, pop eax return slash slash sh. And now into this gadget to now copy that. So these five bytes, if you think of it atomically, essentially says copy the string slash slash sh into the address of data plus four. So we've already copied bin to dot data. So if I, using a pointer to dot data, we have the string slash bin slash slash sh. Uh, now we need to zero out the data after that. Yeah. You said on the on this base, the other string would have the, the null character, right? Yeah, so now we need to put the null, exactly. So that's what we're going to do right here. Oh, okay. So this is zeroing out the address of data plus eight. So we're going to uh, set edx to be the address of data plus eight, right? So the, the four bytes that are after that. We're going to XOR eax with itself, which cancels, which makes it zero. And then we're going to call our gadget. So here, now we have a null terminated string in memory, slash bin slash slash sh. So now we, we have that, which is the first argument to exec the ER system call. We now need to build up this argv vector. I'm going to kind of, I think this is getting a little bit redundant. We essentially use our gadgets to set up the rest of these vectors. Uh, we add a null there as well, and now we call exec de with the address of dot data, the address of data plus 12, the address of data dot plus 8. Go through all this fun stuff. And now we need to set eax to be 11. Wow, why is this so slow? So you can see it's kind of ridiculous. We clear out eax, set it to 0, and then we increment it 11 times. So we just do this 11 times to get eax to be 11, and then call in 80. OK. And the final part of our Python script, we're going to print out this payload, which we can then type in as the argument. So let's actually walk through this, and it'll make a lot more sense. So now we can create a Python script, call it exploit.py. We can run it and set a breakpoint right at the end of the leave function. So now we've overwritten a ton of the stack, right? Not just a little bit, but we've controlled the vast majority of this stack. So at the return, it's going to go to this 0806E910, which was our first gadget. So going there, so these are all the gadgets just kind of laid out next to each other. So what is it going to do? Pop EDX, so pop that value on the stack. So now EDX, this was the address of dot data. Return from that, so now start executing at this next gadget, this pop EAX. Pop that value off the stack return. So now we have the string slash bin slash sh in eax. We're going to now call this gadget to copy that there. Return. Do the same thing to do the next string slash slash sh. Then we're going to uh, xor eax, so make eax 0. Now we're going to write out 0 to uh, address about data plus 8 past that. All right, we will keep going through this. All right, cool. So now, right before we get to the int 80, we can do a breakpoint. We can look at this string that's at this address. We can see that this is the string slash bin slash slash sh. We can look at the two words here to make sure that that's set up correctly, our arguments here. And we can now see that if we continue, we've executed this new program, bin dash. We've essentially tricked using little bits of the program's code. We've tricked it into executing slash bin sh with these arguments. So this is completely independent of uh, any address space layout randomization. Um, this is a super cool technique. The nice thing is you don't have to do this by hand. So there are automated tools to do this kind of exploitation. Uh, Pwn tools, Rop Gadget, Ropper are all tools that you can run on a binary and it will tell you uh, sometimes all the different gadgets, and, or definitely all the gadgets, and sometimes uh, will automatically build that rock chain for you. 
So that was, you know, how we actually built that was you can run into this tool and it will try to build it for you. Uh, also, if you want to get more into this, Pwn Tools is a very comprehensive library used by a lot of the top CTF teams. Um, that's <coughs> actually we're at the end of stuff. So um, I will not be here on Thursday. I'm going to try to get a guest speaker who's a security professional, but we'll, I'll keep you posted uh, to what's going to happen on Thursday. Uh, no office hours today. Uh, it's been a good semester. See you all at the final.